Okay, so to get started with uh, this week's community call, uh, we're gonna be looking at the metrics for Research Hub. And so the first one uh, that's probably the most relevant is Google Analytics. Um, so again, just to say it for the recording, if anybody has any like thoughts or questions, like feel free to jump in at any point. Um, I can't see anyone. So uh, yeah, either have Anton call on you or just jump in, it's no big deal. So um, here's our weekly active user chart. This is for the last seven days, and this is for the previous time period. So we had 1,200 people visit Research Hub for the last seven days, which is down 15.5% from the previous seven days. Um, one important thing about Google Analytics is it doesn't track everyone. I think like a whole lot of tech savvy people have like um, analytics blockers on. So I think Google Analytics gets like 60 to 70 percent of people so all these numbers are like a little bit depressed and don't include like the most technologically savvy people um some of the things that google analytics has in it are like traffic channels so this is like how did we end up getting new users um one of the big parts of this is like organic search so when people like search research hub or they search like the title of a paper like, uh, do they actually come to Research Hub from that? Or like what proportion of our total new users come from those channels? Um, this also has direct. So that's like if you click on a researchhub.com link or just go directly to Research Hub in your browser. And then there's social uh, stuff like Twitter, Reddit, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, that kind of thing. And then I'm not sure what referrals are. Um, it might be like a referral link we have. Um, but yeah, so this is what shows like how we acquire users. Um, you can look at like the specific like uh, social stuff and even the page that people came from too in more detail. Here's our like overall picture of active users. Here's a 30 day moving average up top, a seven day moving average, and then the daily uh, like actual users of Research Hub. Here's retention. So this is how many users who showed up today show up a week from now, two weeks from now, three weeks from now, and so on. Um, this is locations, but it isn't very accurate because lots of people use VPNs, that kind of thing. And uh, time of day of when people actually show up to Research Hub. Um, does anybody have any thoughts so far on Google Analytics? Anything you'd like to explore more? For context, we could back this out to 28 days. Uh, Patrick, are you going to go through like some of the other, is this just like an overview of Google Linux? Are you going to go into any more or is this kind of? So we also have Amplitude here, which is uh, Google Analytics is good for weekly active users. So these are like people who are showing up to the website. Uh, Amplitude is good for weekly active contributors. So these are all actions that are taken on the website. And then we have Hotjar2 which is like a more like granular view of like a heat map on the website where are people clicking and then we can even see recordings. So like, uh, like if you landed on like the live feed page, like what did you do after that? Or if you landed on like a specific paper from Reddit, um, like how many people like actually clicked into the comment section or like decided to continue to browse other portions of research hub. So I figured we'd start with uh, Google Analytics first, talk through it all, and then do Amplitude, talk through it all, and then finish up with Hotjar. But we can go back and forth like uh, to whatever uh, you find most relevant. Yeah, like I know for me, like when I use uh, Google Analytics, um, I, I, I look at also like the behavior, but you guys, yeah, actually like, you know, Typically, what are the pages people are going to? How are they flowing through the the, the um, yeah? And I guess like here, you can kind of see the majority of people st are staying on the the main page, and then the hubs, of course, it makes sense is the next one, and then it kind of like flows down from there. Um, um, uh, and then acquisition, like I always look at like the kind of going into like um, breaking down. Yeah, we know like a lot of the organic search is coming from. Uh, we generally we're getting acquisitions, but uh, looking at the word, the digital one are like social and referrals, because that's like, you're like, oh, okay, are people tweeting about it? Uh, so is it coming from Twitter? And uh, just understanding like where people are coming from uh, is something I, I do here as well. Um, 
but that's kind of where I start. Yeah, so so feel free. If you think we should dive into the social to see where uh, people are like uh, referring to us? Yeah, yeah. It's like it just yeah, and it's I don't know what the plan. It's just like it's just interesting to know like okay, you know, here we can kind of see Twitter, Facebook are probably the biggest drivers. Um, I'm surprised it's Facebook's on there. Um, do we have like is it like uh, do we have a Facebook page or? Um, do you have anything on Facebook, Patrick? Yeah, so we do. It's not really well built uh, out. All of the Facebook traffic has come from one post that was shared at the very beginning of COVID um, by someone who uh, had a specific disorder and was like, oh, this kind of reminds me of like the symptoms of COVID. So he wrote up uh, kind of like a preprint of sorts. It's not a scientist, um, published it to Research Hub. And then he's also a digital marketer. So he shares it around these patient groups on Facebook. So we get oh, a decent wow. amount of Facebook traffic just from this one paper uh, that was shared. Who has a digital marketer who wrote it and like is interested about like getting his opinion out there more. That's wild. Okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's like maybe our most visited page uh, on all Research Hub that's actually a paper page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so but yeah, no, it's good. It's interesting. Yeah, it just it shows that like you know, we got a lot of a lot of users. Um, um, yeah. Is it possible to filter out uh, editors, for example? So uh, not from Google Analytics. I know our team is working on amplitude statistics. So here's our North Star, which is weekly active contributors. Uh, basically, everybody who's come to Research Hub and taken an action on the website. Uh, we plan to have this um, uh, basically weekly active contributors minus editors on a hub to hub basis. So this, it might be in the leaderboard already on Research Hub, but um, it, yeah, if it's not, we plan on putting it into a dashboard uh, for everybody to be able to see. So Patrick, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I know you mentioned um, the one article that was uh, super successful from Facebook that was posted by a digital marketer. I mean, the first uh, thought that came to my mind was, um, you know, like, what about that exactly made it that successful? Because at the end of the day, I mean, those are potentially strategies that the editors can use as well um, to drive traffic um, to the platform. Uh, so, for example, I mean, in the hubs, like uploading your um, research article and then putting in, you know, like the terms you put, right, to describe what the article is about, rather than just the, um, you know, scientific jargon um, that is usually associated with the abstract. But, you know, like strategies like that, you know, that could actually help in SEO optimization and drive folks um, from these different platforms, um, you know, posting on Twitter feeds and social media pages and even like on blogs as well, like your personal blogs. So I was just wondering if that was like uh, a strategy that we have um, tried to explore or if there were like any plans um, towards doing that and just making folks like aware of like the basics of, you know, SEO optimization and stuff. Yeah, totally. It's a great point. So I'm pretty sure this is the paper uh, that we get all the referrals from Facebook on. Um, and a lot of the commentary, this is like from before we changed our comments around, so they're no longer show up. But um, yeah, a lot of it was like, these are actually patients who have uh, MCAS and um, thought that the symptoms were similar to COVID. So yeah, all this traffic is from Ryan essentially posting it to different patient groups on Facebook. Um, Another strategy which has been like pretty successful that I've used in the past is posting papers to our science, which is like this really large uh, subreddit on Reddit. Um, there's like pretty predictable papers that do well uh, in our science. Uh, for instance, like if you like post a paper about like uh, cannabis or ketamine, like it normally does pretty well. So um, I posted papers where uh, it'll get to the top of our science and then we'll have like 50,000 inbound clicks from that. So um, I was chatting with Ricardo and one thing we want to do either next week during the community call or we can actually do like a specific workshop on this. Like I can uh, kind of show people the process that I go through when I want to share a post to Reddit and like with the intention of driving a lot of inbound traffic and show others how they could do that for their own hub. Uh, Reddit's amazing. And Facebook is decent too, because there's a lot of uh, very specific uh, groups and subreddits. 
So um, like, for instance, one of my favorite on Reddit is our immunopsychiatry. And they talk about how like, uh, like problems with the immune system can end up manifesting in psychiatric conditions. And so uh, I have found papers that I think are relevant for that subreddit. And I'll like uh, start a conversation on it and then post to that subreddit. So um, I would bet that almost every hub has like a parallel Facebook group or subreddit where if you uh, share a paper that you think would resonate with other online communities and start like a little bit of a conversation, it's very easy to share it and then try and like draw people in from other places uh, that are also talking about these sort of papers, but maybe don't have the same tools that Research Hub has to host the discussion. So yeah, either next week uh, for the community call or like a specific like session, if people are more interested in that, um, we can walk through like a bunch of these strategies in order to take advantage of like sharing stuff to social media to drive traffic. I, I think Pet Petri, those are good ideas. I think the hard, the one of the hardest parts is you know because um, let's say you copy the URL of that paper there and we pay, you paste it in um a twitter tweet or a facebook post like generally like it would have a header image so like it auto, auto generates an image so maybe like some of the, the text but like because it doesn't do that automatically like we we as like editors would have to like retype it maybe add a picture whereas like if you kind of maybe ask kobe how hard it is to implement something like just like header header image and like a description that could take the first couple lines of the abstract then it is very easy to share making like sharing easy like, easier for us it like help a lot to just getting the word out right yeah totally and, and so we actually had like social media cards where initially we were trying to pull like at least one figure from the paper and have it like show up uh, highlighted here and it would be in the social media card when posted to like uh, you know twitter reddit that kind of thing um I think it's not very hard for us to implement something like that. So if, if you all wanted us to, um, we could definitely do something. I, I don't know if any engineers, sorry, I can't see. Um, we have anybody from our team here who could maybe comment on that as well. Do we? Yeah, I don't think we have any of our engineers here, but I will definitely mention that. And uh, I, I think it would only take like a day or so in order to do something like that. Um, if we want to scale internationally, I know that there are different versions of Facebook around the world. For example, for example, in China, there's a different version. In Ukraine, in Russia, I mean, not not different versions, but uh, the users are using different social media platforms. So, if we could post on that platforms, of course, with the translation button available, maybe this will increase the users, possibly. Yeah, it's a great idea. I mean, I'm thinking eventually we should have, like, uh, as part of our ELN, um, just make this very, very easy for people, where we can even give suggestions of the different type of sites that they could share to. Um, like the exact copy that would do well. Um, but yeah, take out a lot of the thought process from it, make it very easy to follow. And yeah, we should we should definitely like think of all of the social media that we could post to, not just like uh, English uh, centric ones. Yeah, and for example, some versions of, of Facebook and some features are not available all around the world. So this could uh, disrupt the network effects and stuff like that. I mean, this happened to me with my posts at some point. Yeah, it's a great suggestion. We should definitely do something like that. Uh, hey, do we know how we are getting uh, the organic search data? Like, uh, are people just searching for research hub or are we ranking for something else as well? So we can take a look. Um, I think the grand majority are Research Hub, but then we also have done a little bit of work to do SEO for specific papers. Um, 
I think there's also like some pixels that we could do to like help uh, um, basically like make this information more detailed. So if we wanted to see like specifically what were people clicking on in Google searches, um, we could do that. I think the majority of it is people searching for research hub and then a little bit from like the titles of specific papers. Do we know what, uh, is there anyone in right now in this call who knows what we're doing in terms of SEO and especially seeing that we have a lot of papers already uh, in our database. So maybe that should help. Can you yes. hear me? Hello? Yeah, we don't have any of the engineers on this call. We did an SEO mm -hmm. audit maybe like a year and a half ago where we like worked with an SEO consultant in order to like uh, try and try and have more content actually be uh, crawlable by Google Spider, who uh, like basically indexes all the websites. But um, yeah, we can, I can, I think I still have the recommendations that they made. So be happy to publish those. Um, and then if you have a specific question, I can like ask our engineers to say exactly what we're doing. Um, there is more work that we could put into SEO, but uh, yeah, SEO seems like a good way to scale community, but not necessarily like to, to bring new people in. I'm not sure how many people like come to a, um, page on Research Hub just totally organically, and then uh, like want to comment on it. So, um, yeah, that's kind of kind of the way we think about it. Is that it's it, it's a good like acquisition channel, but it's not going to necessarily increase our weekly active contributors. It would increase the weekly active users, but uh, the amount that we'd convert into contributors, we have to figure out that conversion first before it makes like a ton of sense to spend uh, time and effort optimizing SEO. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. Does anybody have uh, specific questions uh, from the Google Analytics side, or should we move on to Amplitude? Yeah, I think you can move on to Amplitude, Pedro. Okay, cool. Yeah, so with Amplitude, these are like specific events uh, that we've recorded and plugged into this dashboard here. Um, we can do this for like pretty much any event that you can think of. So if there are any other categories here that you'd like to see, um, let me know and we can ask our engineers to kind of build it. So uh, our North Star is weekly active contributors. Um, this is the last, I believe, three months worth, but we can even like back this up really far just to show the whole story. Um, so yeah, if we go to maybe... Let's do since 2020. Oh, too many. Um, let's do February 2020 or 2021. So this is weekly active contributors. There's always like events essentially that'll happen. I believe this is like when we interviewed uh, the founder of SciHub. Um, we did something else beforehand that like got us a little bit of media attention. Um, but yeah, this is kind of like the big picture of just about a year worth of weekly active contributors. Uh, here's the editor program. So we can see like a little like kind of like upward uh, uh, trajectory here. Going back to look at some of these other metrics. Uh, here's discussions. So comments. User signups. Uh, total number of upvotes. Papers uploaded, like individual papers. Um, we used to automatically import papers a while ago, so we were keeping track of that, but we disabled that feature maybe six months ago. Um, total number of boosts. So this is a, a number of times people supported each other using RSC. And this, I believe, is the total number of RSC uh, used when supported. And so those are the categories we have so far. Um, I can dig into any one of these kind of like on a larger time scale or different uh, like slice rather than weekly. We could look daily or monthly. Is there anything here people are interested in seeing more? Yes, I guess Patrick. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. 
No, I just wanted to say uh, as another metric that we could consider in the future, if you want to do like a targeted campaign, for example, could be that of like uh, paper claims. So like if we're targeting our campaign into like, hey, come on, research up, claim your paper. That's something that not now, I mean, but we were thinking about that, like for like using emails and like basically telling people to come on research up for claiming their paper. That's something that maybe we would like to add in the future. Yeah, one hundred percent. It's a great point. So, um, super admins on the site now can see this. So, this is like our our paper claiming portal. Um, we still have a bug here, so we haven't been able to like accept all of these yet. But once it's like figured out, we can actually see like the total backlog of paper claim uh, requests uh, from like a super admins user. But yeah, it would be very easy for us to to throw this into Amplitude too. And maybe I wonder if there's a way to easily give community members access to this so you all can uh, check it, you know, kind of at your own convenience. Now that have to have us uh, broadcast it. I'll, I'll write that down too and make sure we can figure that out. Malik? Yeah, hi. Uh, quick question on just about that, um, you know, claiming the claiming the paper up uh, and, and Ricardo had mentioned that to me uh, yesterday or day before is uh, like, so like right now, um, like, are you guys like, uh, there is an email template, like, would you guys like send it to like, let's say a paper has like six authors, like to everybody or like the, the key uh, last author or um, like any suggestions on that? So right now, and any of the authors can claim? So as long as your name's on the paper, you're able to claim it. Um, okay. okay. And, and and you guys are just like trying to find these um, these uh, authors like through online Google search, like their contacts, like if they're at a university or something and then find their contact. So we haven't done like a ton of intentional outreach to authors asking them to claim their papers. It, it's more from people who show up and see their paper and then see like the, the claim button and okay. kind of do it on their own accord. I do think there is a future where we should recruit authors uh, just to be available um, to answer questions about their papers. But um, yeah, we haven't put too much like intentional thought into strategies behind how to do that most effectively. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. So Patrick, I'm like, oh, kind of curious because like, you know, it's one of those things where um, you optimize what you measure, et cetera, but like uh, for retention, uh, speaking with retention, because I'm, I'm assuming like that's what you're currently working on, right? Like working on retaining people and having metrics that support, that's the, however you decide to retain people. Is that kind of like the idea with these KPIs? Is that how you develop them or pick them? Yeah, so uh, we picked weekly active contributors um, just because it's, easy to measure and a good kind of metric for like uh like how welcoming of a community do we have so like how many people are like actively participating in the website um this kind of like includes churn within it so um yeah it's a it's a function of how many new contributors do we have each week and then how many contributors uh drop off or like don't continue to contribute um we could put more focus into retention, like keeping people who are on Research Hub uh, within Research Hub. Kind of the uh, thought process that we have here is our best, or our best retention mechanism is uh, the community. So um, like here's our weekly active contributors uh, like during the editor program. There's a solid like 20-ish users who are not um, editors but still come back on a weekly basis. And these are people who are like uh, have been involved in the community for a while. So there's uh, like a kind of like a social bond um, that has kept people uh, so far. I think is our best retention mechanism. Um, do you have anything specific that you'd like to see, Joey, when it comes to like uh, kind of like are we retaining people or like specific metrics? I guess. Yeah, I guess like uh, yeah, it depends on what your definition is. Uh, like a. I guess a contributor, when you say contributor, like the definition of contributor for this metric, is it a contributor posts a paper or comments? Or upvote. Or upvote. So it's like at least one thing within a week span, right? And then they kind of pop as a, a one. That's yep. how they pop on a chart, right? Yep, exactly. Uh, yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting and like to break it down to see like, you know, 
contr contributions due to paper posting, comments, or um, upvotes. I don't know if you've done that. Seems like maybe you have. Um, and then just like to see like you know is majority of the contributions the like paper posting or is the majority upvotes uh, or, or comments um, and then knowing that we kind of know if we're going to develop a new feature or do some sort of new campaign like if we think re retention means more people posting or commenting then we should see an uptick in, in that metric um, that's kind of how i see a lot of this sorry does that make sense i don't know yeah no that makes a lot of sense um yeah. Yeah, so I don't think that we have like like unique um, contributors measured for each like uh, category of activity that goes into the weekly active contributor metric. It would be easy for us to do, to do that though, so we could put that together. Um, I know kind of uh, one perspective that we have is, for instance, it's probably very easy to get people to upvote, and so. Um, if we were to create features that like incentivize upvoting, it would probably maximize our weekly active contributors. Um, but zoomed out from that, does it actually provide value for scientists? It's hard. It's hard to say. So we could kind of like uh, game our features to maximize this metric, but we think we sort of have to be a little bit more holistic. Um, when we're like thinking of new features. Um, and then like once we kind of like uh, know that we're providing value for sure, we can uh, very much optimize. But does that make sense where like practical example of this, um, we want to build like a peer review feature for uh, papers that are shared through our ELN. Um, it's probably going to be pretty hard to get people to do peer reviews but the value that would come from that would be significantly higher than if we built a feature where um, maybe users can like invest in upvote and then uh, like earn RSC for helping to curate content within hubs. Um, yeah, does that perspective make sense where these are like, it's good to see like where the ship is going, but we like want to get across the sea, not necessarily like uh, let where the wind is blowing tell us exactly where to go. Yeah, yeah, a lot of this is trial and error with, with general with metrics. So it's tough. This is like always, this is like the hardest thing. Um, but I think, yeah, I think if we can break it down a little bit, get some granular, even like getting a metric that does um, upload of papers over users gives you like how many papers per user, and then you get to kind of see like, it's probably like a U shape, right? There's a lot of users who post less than one. And then there's probably like a lot of people post more than five. You know what I mean? Like, and just like talking to those users, you're posting a lot and seeing like, you know, oh, how, like, how can we make you make it easier for you to post more? Um, it seems like you're using this quite often. Again, there's exploratory yeah. stuff, but. Yeah, totally. Sure. Patrick, I was just wondering, why wouldn't it be useful uh, to incentivize people to upvote uh, to, to scientists? I don't understand. I guess, I mean, yeah, I don't understand why it wouldn't be. So in my mind, um, the curation of papers is not as big of a problem as peer review is, just from like a holistic sense in science. And so if, if we're able to solve the problem of like, figuring out how we can pay peer reviewers for contributing their peer review content rather than have it be like a volunteer basis where people are basically doing work for free for big companies. That to me feels like a bigger unlock where lots of people have this problem. Lots of people are trying to work on this issue um, than necessarily uh, like a, a curated registry of papers for specific fields. Um, if that makes sense. I guess an, another piece here too is like, there are other ways that we could do curation outside of upvotes. So um, like we could, like uh, Altmetric does a good job of helping to like, uh, basically like rank papers based on social media activity and stuff like that. And so it does provide value, but it's not um, as exciting of a problem as like trying to help align the incentives of peer review um, th does that make sense? 
it does, but it's also like, you know, people get more research coin for, you know, like whatever they posted or for participating. And I understand that long term, that's not the only thing you want to incentivize, but that might actually be something that's pretty valuable in the growth phase. So I feel like that aspect of it shouldn't be ignored either. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't thought about it deeply, but it just seems to me that there is utility in incentivizing uh, people getting more research coin. Yeah, totally. And, and I think like one like piece of context here too is like, we definitely do not have all the answers, right? Like we're, we're kind of like operating like from a gut feeling at the end of the day. And so like if, if we do a call like this and, you know, everybody is like, oh, hey, like, incentivizing upvoting is actually a lot more exciting than trying to like address peer reviews, then that can help shift our team's priorities. Um, so yeah, like it, it, we don't have all the answers for sure. And so like if, if people are really excited about trying to like make it easier or give a better reason for people to upvote, then we can definitely like try and shift our attention towards building features that like help to maximize that. Well, I mean, like, so I'm not sure, right? Because you guys, like the, the tricky part is like not incentivizing behavior that can't scale, right? You don't want to just like incentivize people coming on the platform just because they think they can make money, but then you get enough of them on there and the platform isn't designed to deal with that. Um, so you have to balance that with like the fact that if people feel like they can make money from the platform, that um, they'll want to do that. So I, I just, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just, it's about balancing those two interests, I would say, and uh, not focusing on uh, either one exclusively. Um, yeah, it's a great point. There are like a ton of considerations. Yeah. So I can uh, jump the hot jar too, just to kind of show you how this works as well. Um, so Hotjar, uh, the two coolest things are heat maps and then the recordings. So this is uh, the last 30 days of like just uh, researchhub.com. Um, if anybody else has like a specific page that they'd want to see, uh, we can like set up heat maps or recordings for specific pages. Um, this may take a second. While this loads, are there any other questions about uh, the amplitude metrics or Google Analytics that we can dive into? Actually, Patrick, like just like overall, go, like uh, what is the? I'm mean, sorry, I come from like I do a lot of product stuff. So like, uh, what's like the pain point? Uh, like the research hubs trying to solve? Because I, I think I agree with you that like peer review is a pain in the ass for researchers. Uh, so I get why you're working on that. Like, is there other pain points you're like uh, targeting, or is that the big one? Yeah, so I, I think there are a bunch, um, depending on like the uh, category of potential users. Um, I can speak from my own experience, where um, when I was in a PhD program, like I would have liked to earn a little bit of financial value for like sharing my expertise online. So um, basically like commenting on stuff I was a kind of expert in and earning value for doing that. Um, so that's the perspective that I come from. I, I know in general is like a, a bigger um, economic problem in science is that there are a lot of like not ideal incentives, um, like the bibliometric citation based reward structure where people uh, become more eligible for grants if you're able to write papers that are highly cited uh, causes a lot of downstream issues where people are kind of exiting from that system now by like publishing in open access journals rather than uh, trying to publish behind paywalls and more prestigious versions. Um, do you have like a so a oh, large way to say like there are a lot of different pain points that we could potentially address. Uh, do you have one that's most exciting to you, Joey? Yeah, I guess like I just always curious like where are we generally moving to, and it sounds like yeah, the one that sounds more interesting to me is just like it sounds like you're moving towards that in that 
Research Hub is another journal where you go publish something. Because if you're trying to build a peer review process, it sounds like that would be the next natural step. Um, it is like just knowing that I think is is like it. I just I just never don't know if that is the. I mean, there's so many things you can do, and that's the issue with uh, some of these is like you can't go everywhere or you can't do everything. Uh, that's just too hard. Um, so I just wanted to know, like, in your perspective, like the one or two things you're like really trying to achieve first. Yeah. So to to me, trying to come up with a different way to encourage research outputs other than citations is the most exciting where you can like in theory with research coin like we can change the incentives you know over time so trying to like create a reward structure for science that encourages behaviors that are good for everyone um i think is a very exciting problem thinking like practically too i know like just in the last year or two uh science has become a much more um publicly debated thing so there are preprints that are used to justify like all kinds of different like policy decisions. And so having like uh, experts provide context to these like scientific documents that are like leveraged by people kind of all across the world to, to change the world basically, I think would be pretty cool. And so to me, that's why peer review is exciting. If there's like a very popular preprint, if we could somehow financially like reward experts for coming in to share context on the value of that preprint, I think is a pretty valuable thing. Um, but that that's just my own vision, my own perspective. So yeah, we're we're open to basically like solving the problems, uh, you know, of the scientific community. And like we know that like we're only a couple people. So the, the more uh, we hear from others of potential pain points that we could help address, I think it's always valuable. We have a few hands, Malik and then Jack Jones. Hi, hi guys. I, I had a couple points to add on to that. I, I really like the peer review part. Um, in addition to the, the, the problems mentioned for the current peer review is, um, you know, like, you know, I'm a peer reviewer and um, sometimes the scheduling um, um, is so, so difficult and the deadlines are so that, you um, that on volunteer basis, um, you know, even if you put your best efforts, sometimes you feel like I could have spent more time with this paper trying to critique it or something. And, and if there is some value provided for that work, I think it would inherently change, um, you know, the type of review that we are getting. And then the second thing, you know, and I don't know if this like fits with what Research Hub eventually would do is I, I really feel like um, the general public, um, you know, just in biomedical science, um, you know, the, um, the 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 general public, you know, pays um, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of taxes for, um, you know, everything, and and all this research is funded by, you know, government at least in biomedical science to NIH and the grants through that, and um, um, and, and and then scientists work on it, and then reviewers work for free, and then. Um, the, the the current uh, publication system is so like expensive that a common person if they want to access science it's it's very difficult and i always felt that you know like after all the efforts um and a lot of volunteer efforts and it's still not accessible and however many articles we can through this can you know give give an access so that i i don't know if that fits in but i, I really feel that that research hub can play a little role there too yeah, thank you for sharing. I couldn't agree more. That's that's kind of what I'm thinking, like for the next like three to six months. So uh, very or very much appreciate you saying that. Sure. It's okay. Um, hey, everybody. Um, my name is actually Mike Stoko. Uh, Jack Jones was a pseudonym I signed up on. Um, I I just introduced myself real quick. Um, I, I have a master's in biochemistry, and I've been a blockchain uh, Bitcoin enthusiast since like 2013. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, I'm so grateful to have met a group of people. You guys are great. Everybody's really working on this problem. Uh, uh, that it's, uh, I'm just grateful to be in the company of such good hearted people. Um, in regards to uh, compensating um, <clears throat> our reviewers, I, I had a couple of thoughts on that. Um, if you had some kind of system where, you know, for instance, if you put it on Ethereum, 
and and you had it uh, in such a way that coins were issued or minted, then in in time, like I know Ethereum has like uh, fifteen second or ten minute blocks in the past. Uh, if you had something similar to that, where where papers were uploaded, kind of like in a block, maybe it's an hour, maybe it's a day, but uh, and 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 you can compensate uh, potentially reviewers um, with a portion of the block reward as well as the authors. Um, maybe even you can compensate a portion of the block reward with um, the people. For instance, if you wanted to go another step of decentralization, perhaps you could uh, go the way of like Filecoin or AR Weave and have your papers decentralized, where people are hosting copies of your entire database and those nodes could be also compensated. And that would also be interesting because it would allow you to, um, you know, paper, it, it, it would be hard to keep papers behind. It might be hard to keep papers behind a paywall if uploaders were compensated and the data was distributed across the network in different countries, for instance. It, it might be hard to uh, keep that completely behind a paywall. But um, anyway, those are just a few ideas uh, I was thinking about. And uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks for saying that. Um, I, I think it's a great point. And so like one piece of context for Research Hub itself, um, we decided to uh, build our app initially if, with uh, kind of like a, a centralized database using Amazon, um, you know, uh, S3 web servers um, and a traditional like web two architecture for the application itself um, with of course, like the token to help uh, address some of these incentive structures in science. Um, the reason why we chose this is because it's just so much easier to iterate quickly on feature sets. Um, we think that one issue with uh, having like a distributed architecture from the beginning is that you have to really set the rules um, in an a priori fashion and it becomes difficult to change once like you've already published like the smart contracts and everything that it would run on and so our, our perspective is we want to um find a value proposition in like a centralized uh, web application first in order to like actually see something that scales and then potentially decentralize the infrastructure after that um i think we also have to make sure that we're doing uh, everything very legally uh, in theory, we're we're taking a long term view to uh, like change the incentives where researchers actually like want to share their papers openly more, rather than kind of like the the sci hub perspective where um, like people are illegally uploading content and then it's it's you know hosted in a way where people can actually like uh, get that content. We we want to address the problem in what we perceive to be a more sustainable fashion where it, it's legal, it's all above board, and you can, like, in theory, try and outcompete some of the, like, established entities in the space that help to, like, limit um, the accessibility of, uh, you know, paywalled scientific content. Do, does that make sense? They're great ideas, though, and I think uh, the, the louder people are in order to, like, encourage us to move in that direction, the faster that we'll, like, move there. So I appreciate you taking the time to stop by and say that for sure. You know, I would just like to add that, you know, I'm I'm dedicated to this project in whatever fashion it goes. And, you know, um, I'd be happy to help anybody uh, in any faction uh, that, you know, they might need my help um, or contribution. It is, it is pretty awesome to be around a bunch of people who care about science. <laughs> I'm definitely ridiculously lucky that I get to spend my full day doing this all the time. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, sorry, I didn't set this up beforehand. I've just got another one going on the homepage now, so I can share this later. But to show how Hotjar works, here's an author page that we did like uh, like about a year ago. So this is like, um, it's showing the hub page, but oh yeah, because this is like a sign up thing. This is from our onboarding, but this is like the underlying is where people actually click on the author page. Um, so yeah, you can basically just see where people are clicking. Like uh, if, people like scroll down um, to like certain portions of the page. On uh, Patrick, Patrick, can you, uh, one second, uh, Nathan, you had something to add before we fully move on to the Hajar demo. Oh yeah, um, that's fine. If in the interest of time, we, I'll be quite brief. It was just on the topic of um, 
peer review. So firstly, I just want to say I'm very excited by, by the idea that we could add peer review to Research Hub. Um, I was just trying to think of a, of a different way of sort of framing this, this discussion of uh, where we want to go and what we want to uh, incentivize and what are the sticking points in doing so. And so I think we're all aware, people who have experience of publishing the issues with scientific journals. And so trying to think about it in a different way, it's it's interesting to think about what do people actually get from publishing in traditional scientific journals. And obviously, there's this vague idea of prestige, but where does it come from? And so firstly, you can think, well, people associate prestigious journals with a rigorous peer review process. But nevertheless, I think that we can all identify that there are some significant weaknesses with the current peer review process. I think one of the great opportunities that Research Hub has is that right from its inception, it's so cross disciplinary. So in medicine, for example, I often uh, I'm surprised by the low weak level of statistical peer review that comes with some of the articles that are published. And actually, Research Hub has this opportunity because it has so many editors with different disciplines to actually allow for um, different aspects of peer review and expertise to be drawn in with the same incentive structure. Um, so I think that's one thing that really Research Hub has going for it if it goes into the peer review space. Um, the second thing that I was thinking about is that actually people sort of associate this uh, metric of impact factor with changes to real world practice. So again, in the medical field, if you are to change a guideline, publishing in a high impact factor journal with a strong research result will be something that would lead to a change in practice. And, and so impact factor is almost seen as a sort of surrogate for that um, because, because that number of citations implies that it's having an impact on downstream research. Um, so I think uh, another interesting idea would be to think about what is the role of a citation score and how can we really replace it with something that offers that same benefit of giving us a metric for downstream impact of the research that has been published. And, and I think that those sorts of discussions will really get to, you know, trying to replace re replace the traditional publication system. Because what they have, of course, is heritage. But these weaknesses are something that we can try and, um, you know, try and mitigate. Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, yeah, I guess um, the reasons why people publish in like prestigious paywall journals, uh, from my perspective, a lot of it, I think, is one impact, like you mentioned, like actually influencing the world. Um, but to me, that's um, more established scientists. Like uh, from my perspective as a grad student, a little bit of it was like, oh man, I just want to get a job one day. And so like publishing in nature means like you're probably going to get a pretty good postdoc, which really increases your chances of like having a professorship somewhere. So um, yeah, I guess like from the perspective of an early career researcher, I my understanding is that people try and publish in the best like impact factor journals they can in order to help their resume in order to like make a sustainable career in science. So I, I think Research Hub could fit in like really well in a place where maybe we can help to supplement um, people who want a career in science. If uh, we're able to have like earning research coin be like a way to have almost like a like a, a side revenue stream. Um, but yeah, I agree. I think the peer review is very exciting and there are a lot of uh, really interesting things we'll learn from trying to address it. Yeah, just a very quick response. I, I totally agree with the point of from a per early career researcher, what you're thinking about is the next grant or the next job that's available to you in the application. And then those publications in major journals are seen as sort of your resume for those jobs. I think the reputation of those major journals, though, tend to come from their impact factor. At least that's a very rudimentary way of looking at it. And so I think it's all about that sort of citation score. Are we replacing the citation score or are we trying to compete with the citation score at their game and have some a, a, an immediate uh, almost equivalent of citation score in Research Hub, whether that be reputation, whether that be research coin, et cetera? If it's okay with everybody else, I'd like to explore this idea a little bit more. Um, so, so downstream effect, like are you saying that um, we could have like a, 
you know, for lack of a better word, like a citation score that included like page views and maybe like um, products that were eventually uh, created from the knowledge presented within this paper, like thinking of downstream impact as more holistic than just like a derivative of citations? Yeah, just a very quick response and then I'll let other people come in. Uh, I think one one trap that we can't fall into is, of course, the, the great thing about the traditional journals is that we aren't looking at page views as a metric. We're looking at the impact of the research. So this is different to publishing a blog post about your research that gets interest from the general public or a TV program or something that covers your research. Instead, the great thing about citation score, although it has its weaknesses, is that it's measuring the direct research impact of the publication. That's interesting. I think there's a lot more that we could explore here. Um, so we have about five minutes left. Does anybody else want to comment on that or look at any of the other metrics in these three tools? I, we I have, we have two hands from Edwin and Ricardo. Yeah, I actually wanted to comment on that specifically. I think it's a great idea, Nathan. Um, I mean, something really simple like having uh, people who use the citations rank their perceived importance of the citation um, could add another dimension to it, right? Where, um, yeah, because you'd imagine that someone that uh, discovered something that that's pretty central, let's say 10 or 15 years ago, uh, their citation could be used a lot when it's actually not central to a lot of research. Um, so there could be like a you know, rating the importance of the citation could serve as just like uh, uh, capping, you know, the like exponential curve, essentially, where you, you, you know, do a certain amount of research and you're just getting the gains past a certain point, even if your, um, your results aren't as important now as they were in the past, let's say. But I mean, I, I don't know, there, there are different ways, but I think one of the simplest ways to deal with the uh, issue that Nathan brought up, which is like have the researchers themselves say how important they think the research is. And that could add another dimension to it that's worth considering. It'd be pretty straightforward to do with something like Research Hub in a way that wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be in other contexts possibly, so. So just to repeat the fact, to make sure I understand uh, accurately, if I was writing a new paper and I had a list of citations that influenced my new paper, um, I would rate the citations that I'm including based on their relevance? Based on your, based on their perceived relevance, yes. Your perception of their relevance to your research. It's an interesting idea, because I've seen a lot of stuff where like, um, like if you, uh, you know, publish a paper that ends up being just proved in a very public fashion, it can still have a lot of citations because people cite it as like a bad example. And so, yeah, I think having context of like how relevant is this citation to the work that I'm presenting today is pretty cool. Um, I'd have to think it through more, but we would definitely be able to do something like that with our uh, electronic lab notebook feature. Um, so yeah, thanks for bringing it up. That's a, it's a pretty interesting idea. Just to elaborate uh, more on what like Edwin and Nathan said, uh, I think another idea could be like, for example, for citations, like when I write a paper, there's normally like two, three papers that are really like useful for my research that I basically started to do my research from. So like, for example, one for a specific material, another one for a specific method. Those are citations that are like central to my work. They have, they should have a different weight to other citation that I put in text so that I reference like to other people that did different works. So being able to basically differentiate between uh, citations in a sort of rank, yeah, but I would basically discriminate between actual citations that I used in a concrete way in my work and other citations that I just, you know, put in the text because, you know, it's always good to have some citations on. Another thing could be uh, giving additional weight to uh, works that 
are you, I mean, you, you yourself proved or other people proved uh, to be true, to be working. So basically I tried this protocol, it worked. I would like this person to be kind of like compensated for like doing a good job and being like, you know, actually fair in reporting their work while there are many works that I tried to replicate and they didn't work. And in the same way, they should be kind of like, let's say downvoted in a sort of way. So we have, I think, the possibility uh, in contrast with like traditional uh, journals to be able to add additional yeah, I, I love the idea of like dimensions of citations or like score to a specific paper. Sorry, just to add like, you know, because they even bring up like the point kind of like I like with Research Hub is because like we just have to create another impact factor because it's it's great to like put subjective relevancy and stuff. But the, the reason why impact factor is so good is because it's so simple and all it is is just taking the number of citations of this paper and converting into a score. and if like research have had something similar because really like like if you think about it to get a high impact um you know to get a good score as an author you, if you publish in a high impact journal you get like a better score as well right it's very cyclical this nature and until we unseat that impact factor uh, i forgot what the author's story is called as well but um until we unseat that then like like it's it's just like i think it's research hub hopefully works in a way that we can compete with it because then it just would drive people to come to Research Hub because really it's another way to get a high impact factor without actually going to a, a high journal. I don't know, does that, does that make sense? I don't know. I, whatever Nathan said though is like, yeah, I totally agree with. I, I think you... one thing that we have to oh. keep in mind when it comes to like impact factor in these like big, big like bibliometric, uh, you know, kind of use cases is um, like they cause a lot of problems and I think they kind of are the genesis of a lot of problems that exist within academia. Like you can look at papers that show that like high impact factor journals, uh, their uh, the studies in them aren't replicated as often as low impact factor journals, because people tend to like overstate their findings in order to be accepted by these like big impact factor journals. So there's a lot of like um, second tier consequences that come from things like impact factor that. Uh, like we want to make sure that we don't contribute to because like in theory people are um partaking in these behaviors that are not ideal um just purely for the reputational reward and if you threw a financial reward on top of that it could really accelerate a lot of the issues and so yeah we just have to be very like intentional when we start thinking about like quality metrics to make sure that we don't cause downstream like bad behaviors like, I love the idea of rewarding people more if their paper does get in independently replicated. Because then, in theory, like, you take away the incentive to overstate your findings or, like, use a statistical method that's not totally representative of the data. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really, really difficult problem because it's hard to always understand how incentives will work. But, yeah, just something, something I think we got to keep in mind when thinking about impact factor, trying to compete with it. It might be worth getting uh, the perspective of someone who actually works on, like, works in the NIH or, or in the context of, like, you know, dispersing grants to people because they might have their own problems with impact scores that we're not considering. And that could help us, you know, design whatever metric in a way that they might find um, more suitable. And that, in, if that information is somehow made available to researchers, um, then they would be more likely to use this platform for publication because they think it would be more advantageous for grant purposes. Because that, that's going to be the thing, right? If you have another metric, but it's, it, you know, they don't think it's going to be helpful getting them published in high impact journals, then it's not as useful. So got to be careful about the design there. Yeah, 100 percent. And I even think like what, what you said, starting to like, I think the eventual end customer for Research Hub is grant committees. Um, if you can help them make decisions that are like more evidence based and like cause downstream positive effects, I think that you could you could get groups like Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, Gates Foundation, like some of these like more forward thinking granting agencies mm -hmm. to, to use like a tool that helps with that. Um, there's a bunch of studies that have looked at like uh, NIH and NSF like granting procedures, and they're like like um, really dishearteningly random. Like 
you know, there's like not really replicated their granting decisions. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a lot of issues that exist within like the, like how capital is distributed to scientists that could be addressed um, where Research Hub could basically do it like more effectively and cheaper than we're currently doing. And I guess like long-term kind of laying out in my mind, the roadmap strategy type uh, conversation, um, having people publish directly to Research Hub, having peer review happen, um, and then eventually starting to address funding. I think the the really cool thing would be if like there was a like a curated list of projects where there were people doing peer review of the project proposals, where if I'm a funder, I can just go to like the biotechnology hub and see like what's the most popular research proposal right now. Let me look at context that experts have on that proposal. Now I can evaluate, you know, the potential grant in a way that doesn't exist. Like I don't have to look at somebody's resume. I can look at like the crowd's opinion of this like research idea. Um, but but yeah, Edwin, I totally agree. I think the the end customer here is the person who's making like the capital allocation decisions for research. And we, we've got to like the stepwise process of like getting enough like um, interesting content and content creators on Research Hub, where then all of a sudden the capital allocators are like, oh, it makes sense where I would use this tool to help me make better granting decisions. Mm -hmm. Makes and sense. I think it's even a positive feedback loop from there, where if granting decisions are happening through Research Hub, then high quality scientists, they're not like, I need to maximize my impact factor in order to get a grant. They can say, I just need to make a really good grant proposal that others think is good, which is a, a you know a better thought process than what currently exists. Dude. Cool. So so we're a little bit over now, but um happy to answer any more questions or go uh, over more metrics if anybody has uh, other thoughts they'd like to share. No, just thanks for doing this, Patrick. Thanks for showing us all that stuff. That was great. Yeah, yeah definitely. And, and sorry I didn't have like an actual heat map ready for Hotjar. Um, once, once this loads up, like I'll share it in the uh, editor channel or even the community channel. And then if you guys are interested, like I think a, like a Hotjar movie night could actually be kind of fun. Like if you just want to like, <laughs> like, see yeah, like, sure. how people are actually using the site. Like there's a lot of insights that I've gotten just from like being bored and randomly just watching user behavior. So happy to do that as well. Um, I, one more thing, Patrick, I, I think we had this conversation initially, but uh, like, uh, what's the, this may not be too readily apparent, but for people who want to just be more involved uh, in this project, what other avenues or like, how might we go about that? Especially for non-technical people. Myself. It's a great question. Um, so I think probably the best thing to do if you want to like get more involved is either to DM me or Anton and mm -hmm. we can help point you in the right direction just to like mm -hmm. uh, just see like your skill set, what you're interested in doing, help to connect you with the people who are doing whatever you're most interested in doing. Um, that's like a, a very like a non answer. So just hit up me or Anton. But um, sure. generally the thing your notifications are off, by the way. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, it's okay. It's, it's fine. Well, I've got to figure out that. But, um, but yeah, I think generally um, helping to grow the community. So like things like outreach, putting together AMAs on papers. Um, okay. We're thinking about tweaking the editor program to help like uh, recruit potential peer review for the next month. So there'll be more details here in like the next day or two. But um, mm -hmm yeah essentially helping to build community and there are a couple cool ways that we could do that um i mentioned earlier like we'll have a call to show how to like post uh papers to reddit and try and help drive inbound traffic from like other social media places so that's another thing that's like it takes like half an hour to do and like if you were to do a facebook ad it's a dollar click typically so you can like create a lot of value through inbound traffic um without very much effort uh just based on the content that we have um but yeah, th thanks for saying that. And I think like short term uh, DMing me and Anton, and then we'll probably try and set up kind of like more uh, established pipelines for other people, you know, who want to help out. We can like point them in the right direction with a little bit more automated fashion. Cool. 
Great. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for coming and for the interest kind of like in this, like, like next level of how the organization operates, like looking at metrics and like how we like think about decisions of like what to build and stuff like that. Like the more um, ideas we have and really like criticism of our plans, the better off that we'll be like just from refining the thought process and everything. So yeah, if you ever want to do this again, I, I don't hate doing this on a monthly basis. I think it would actually be pretty cool just to like keep everybody in the loop of what's like happening um, from a very top level view. But yeah, thanks. Thanks everybody for coming for sharing your ideas. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Goodbye. See everybody. Bye everyone. Bye.